we are in a series right now on the parables. Um, and these are stories that Jesus told to draw us in to a very powerful kingdom truth. Um, and I believe we are in the last week of parables. I think this is the last one that we're going to do. I'm still putting together next week's, and who knows what might happen. There might be another parable, amen? Um, we'll see. Um, and then after that, after next week, we're going to go into a new, new series um, in the book of Habakkuk. Say Habakkuk. And some of you are like, you're saying it wrong. It's Habakkuk, and there's, there's all kinds of different pronunciations. That's fine. I'm calling it Habakkuk. And we're going to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through that tiny little Old Testament book. Some of us have read it, and some of us haven't. And, and here's essentially what it is, is it's a conversation in prayer between an Old Testament prophet and the God of the universe. And so you'll get a part of the conversation from the prophet, and then God responds, and it goes back and forth across the whole book. And it's a way for us to see practically how our prayer life sometimes is. And so I'm looking forward to that. But here's today's parable. Luke chapter 18, if you got a Bible, chapter 18, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible with you, no problem. It's right here on the screen. It says, one day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. I'm going to pause this right there real quick. If you've been tracking with us through this series, you know that what just happened there is a little bit weird. And here's why. From the very beginning, we said that the parables Jesus told were often just the story without an explanation. Jesus would put the illustration out there there to the crowds, and it was up to them to listen, to ask questions, to chew, to seek God on what the thing meant, because Jesus would always say, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It was a hearing test. Do we want to know what God says? This one today is different, because Jesus is just with his disciples. They're there privately and he's just telling them something. And you notice, he tells them the point of the story before he even gets started with the story. The point is, always pray and never give up. And many of us know what it is to pray. But do you know what it is to pray and never give up? To pray. And then you don't get the answer that you want. And then you pray again. And God hasn't answered you yet. Or it feels like he's delayed. And then you pray again. And you pray again. And just like Dory said, just keep swimming. Just keep praying. Just keep... Come on. Just keep praying. This is his point. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. This is a great guy, yes? He doesn't care about God, doesn't care about people. A widow of that city came to that judge repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. So he doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about people. He's just that kind of a public servant that you're like, who hired you for this role? But he's there. And so she comes to him and she asks for justice in her particular case. And she has to come repeatedly because he's not giving her justice. Now, why wouldn't he give her justice the very first time? You have to ask yourself. Maybe she didn't have any money to bribe him with. Maybe she didn't have any influence or power in the next election to help him, i.e., she wasn't someone that he cared about necessarily. Maybe he just didn't like her. Maybe he had no inner moral compass like Jesus is trying to ind indicate, but she comes repeatedly. Why? Because the squeaky wheel gets the oil, amen? Amen. Luke 18, the judge ignored her for a while, but finally said, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. <laughs> so she comes to him once and he ignores her. So what does she do? She comes again, but she just doesn't come again. She comes probably every single day. And maybe she comes three times a day. I imagine her out front of his house with like a little picket sign. Give me justice. Give me justice. Give me justice. And she's driving him nuts. And isn't that the way that it would work? And you're kind of cheering her on because she at least sticks with it. I love that about her. Many of us, when we get the no initially, we get mad or we get discouraged and we quit. And she doesn't give in. So verse 6, then the Lord said, learn a lesson from the unjust judge. 
Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people? Who are his chosen people, by the way? Christians, people who love Jesus. His chosen people who cry out to him day and night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. And when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? So you've got a mega jerk judge. And Jesus is saying God is better than this mega jerk judge. Seems pretty basic, doesn't it? Uh, But she got justice in the end. The point is not keep going to God because that will manipulate God because he's a bad God. The point is not drive God crazy with your prayers. Here's the point. The point is that God is infinitely greater than that mega jerk judge. God is infinitely better, wiser, more loving, more capable, more powerful, more everything. And sometimes if you could x-ray our prayer life, the way we act toward God is as if he were that mega jerk judge. Because you've got my theology of what I believe about God, what I believe about prayer, but then you've got my actions in prayer. And Jesus says, if you look at the two things, your actions kind of reveal that sometimes you're not coming to God as if he's a good God, as if he's a good father who loves you and wants to bless you. And then he gets to the very end of it and he says, and when I come back at my second coming, Jesus says, will I even find faith on the earth? It feels like he's changing the subject, but he's not changing the subject. Because what he's saying is not, not just do you have faith that you believe that God is there, but do you have faith that he is a good father? Is there that faith even out there that God is good? Will he find that? So here's a parallel passage because sometimes the words of Jesus can be hard to understand. And one of the best ways to interpret the words of Jesus is to find some other words of Jesus in a parallel passage and use them together to understand the picture better. Does that make sense? So this is Luke chapter 11, verse 10 in a parallel passage. Jesus is going to make the same point. He says, for everyone who asks receives. He's talking about prayer again, asking God for things. Everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. That's a silly idea. Yes? Verse 13. So if you sinful people, you sinful parents, you broken parents who hardly even know what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, I love the way that he does this. He says, come on, let's get real. You're not perfect parents, are you? We aren't. See, sometimes you're grumpy with your kids, aren't you? Come on. We know we're not supposed to have favorites, but sometimes we treat them as if we have favorites. Sometimes we are just pretty darn selfish. Sometimes we are so busy that we don't give them the time and listen to them deeply the way that we should. Your spouse ever tell you, you need quality time with one of our kids? You need to be a more active listener with them? Why? Because we're broken, sinful parents. And Jesus is calling that out. He's like, you're broken, sinful parents, but at least you wouldn't give them a scorpion, right? And he's like, and even you, you wouldn't give them a scorpion. Why do you go to God as if he's going to give you a scorpion? Why do you go to God as if if I ask for this thing in prayer, he's probably just going to give me the opposite? He's probably not going to listen to me. He's probably got favorites out there. You know, those people with those really thick leather-bound Bibles, they get their prayers answered, but not me. You know what I'm saying. Sometimes we treat God like he's a heartless father. See, Jesus isn't just doing a comparison of the mega jerk judge and the imperfect parent and God the father in heaven. He's contrasting them. He's saying, I'm giving you negative things to think about here. 
to, to, to uncover the fact that sometimes your faith has gotten skewed. God is infinitely better. He is kind, he is loving, he is powerful, and he is generous. So Jesus kind of invites this comparison with parents. So it got me thinking about my own parenting life. And again, imperfect, right? Kind of broken. So I remember this time, and, and one of our kids, and I'm not going to name my kids. It's up to you to figure them out, um, if you know my kids here. Um, but one of them, I think they were like two years old or something. We're at the, at the table, and it's breakfast, and they're eating cereal, and they get to the end of their bowl, and they're like, could I have some cereal? And either Linda or I walks into the kitchen to get their cereal, and we clearly had not walked fast enough because all of a sudden we heard from the kitchen, I want cereal now from the two-year-old. So all of a sudden, you know, we kind of walk back to the kitchen door with no cereal in our hands because the disrespect and the impatience in your character means even though I wanted to give you the cereal, I wanted to make this a yes moment for you, I cannot because if I did... I would reinforce that negative character in you. And so I just said, because of what you said, because of how you said it, I have to convert the yes into a no. Now, if you could have sat down and tried to talk sense into that two-year-old child, which you couldn't, (laughs) it's not about the cereal. It's about your disrespect. And uh, they're just not in a spot. They can fully process all of that yet. So what did they conclude? They conclude dad's just grumpy today. Dad's anti-cereal today. That's that's where their mind went, right? And we do that sometimes. And so sometimes when we come to God with the spiritual maturity of a two-year-old and he says no to us, we misunderstand him. And in our misunderstanding, it hurts us. That's just me, probably. It's so stinking easy to misread God, especially his nose. There was another time our kids wanted a Nintendo Wii. You know, like, why would anyone want that? They're so old. This was a long time ago. (laughs) It was the hip thing, you know. Everybody had to have it, and... um, And we wanted them to have it. And I'll just say this. As parents, we wanted to tell our kids yes, okay? So we had this woman. Her name was Karen Lohr. And she was one of these, like, super godly women in our church. And I just remember sitting at the back of the church building one time and talking to her about her parenting strategy. And she said, I always want to tell my kids yes if I can. She said, some parents, their their default is no, right? It's like, I'm no, but you're going to have to convince me to be yes. She's like, no. I'm going to be yes as much as I possibly can. And sometimes I might get you to change the way you requested that thing so I can make it a yes. Does that make sense? Like, I want to be yes so much that when I have to say no to my kids, like, they know no is no. And it doesn't mean that mom doesn't love me. All that stuff. Anyway, that was pretty influential to Linda and I. And so they wanted this Nintendo Wii, and, and we just kind of had this moment where, where the, the kids were just of a certain age, and there was allowance, and there was chores, and there were little odd jobs that were going on, and there was money coming in to these kids. And so we're like, you know what, this would be a great moment for you guys to save up for a Nintendo Wii. And so we challenged them. And I don't even know if I believed at the time that they were actually going to do it, but they did. And they started saving got really serious, and over a course of probably eight or nine or ten months, they were almost to the level that they could buy their own Nintendo Wii. And, you know, you have one of those moments where you're like, wow, we're better parents than we thought we were, you know? Um, Anyway, it was just kind of working. So then a birthday was coming up, and one of the grandparents called us up and said, we know this Nintendo Wii is really the hip thing. Can we buy them a Nintendo Wii for their birthday? And I'll make a little side comment toward you grandparents in the room. Um, (laughs) 
it's, it's nice, the etiquette is good to call the parents first, especially with the really large gifts. Sometimes you don't know the flow of what's going on in the household with them and the kid. You don't know what's appropriate. It's just good to, to enter in with that. Sometimes, and this is a whole other sermon, but sometimes you need to let the mom and dad have the big win, not you, grandma and grandpa. So you lift them up in their authority in the household because that's super important. So just, just walk carefully with that. It's not rights and wrongs. It's just walk carefully with it. Anyway, so we had trained grandma and grandpa well. And they called us, and it was so great. And when they called us and they asked us, we started to think about it. We're like, you know what? The thing is, they've learned the lesson we wanted them to learn. They're all the way here. And so we actually told grandma and grandpa, we're like, go ahead and get it. And then the birthday happened, and, and, and they unwrapped it. And oh, my gosh, it's the we. And, 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 and we set up this thing that night, same night as the birthday party. We're like, okay, grandma and grandpa, you take the kids to Walmart with the money that they've saved, and you let them buy all the games for the Wii that they want to buy with the money that they've saved. Because it let the kids be the ones who are respected and honored for, look at what I've earned. <clears throat> I would love to tell you we knew that's where it was all headed. <laughs> we didn't. A thousand ways that could have gone wrong. But we were trying to make decisions based on what will develop their character. Is it possible sometimes God's trying to do that with you? Sometimes in the delay, sometimes in the no that he tells you, sometimes it is what he's trying to do in your soul is bigger than the blessing that you're asking for sometimes. And, and, and again, back to the words of Jesus, look how clumsy it was for Linda and I. God knows the future. God knows exactly what he's planning in your life. It's not clumsy at all with him because God is so good. Amen? So when we pray and we get the delay and we're not sure why he isn't answering our prayer, in that space, in that gap, lies come in into our hearts. Yes? Here's some lies. Let me walk you through these. Here are the lies that come in the waiting. Number one, the reason God hasn't answered my prayer yet is because he's not ultimately there. He just isn't there. My prayers are bouncing off the ceiling because there is no God of the universe. It's all been a myth all along. I'm just going to say it, and I know we're in church because some of us have thought of it. Some of us have struggled with this. He's not there means I'm all alone in this life. That is a difficult lie to walk with. The second one is that he can't help. Maybe he'd like to, but he can't. Whatever I've asked, it's not in his capability, or he's not as strong as I thought. Whatever the, the thing is, I have to fix life myself. That is the fear of the control freak. Got any control freaks in the room? Come on, some of us. I prayed, I asked God, but now it's up to me to get in there. Next, he's mad at me. He's mad at me because I haven't earned it. He's mad at me because I sinned somewhere along the way. And so he's given me a no or he's not answering me because there is some more work that I have to do spiritually in order to get him on my side on this thing. And that's religion, guys. That's law. That's us trying to earn with God. And it's always the wrong path. And then lastly, he does not care. And I am not loved. And I am not seen. Do you see the power of these lies? <clears throat> this is why it's critical that Jesus would give this parable. Because it's not just you ought to pray more. It's no. In the persevering in prayer is the rejection of those lies. As you keep going to God in faith and say, no, I know who you are. And I'm going to ask again and pray again, and pray again, is you reject the lies. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says, <clears throat> and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. God is able. Do you see that verse? God is able. He can do 
all things for you, to help you in your life, and to keep you on the right path walking with Jesus. That's what that verse says. So that's a faith-building verse. If you struggle, get a verse like that. Write a verse like that down. Put it up on the mirror. Do you know what I'm saying this morning? Sometimes we just need something that reminds us every single day, no, wait a second, God is for me, and God is able, and I need to walk in that kind of faith. Pray different than I've prayed before. So then you're saying, okay, if he's able, he's as able as the scripture says he is, then why? Then why have I prayed and I haven't gotten the answer that I want? So here's four reasons why he has not yet said yes to you. The delay. The the delay is changing your heart. The delay is building your faith. There's a timing that only he can see. Or sometimes, sometimes, this answer has to be no. So I'll start you with the very first one. The delay is changing your heart. There's a verse in Psalms 37, verse 4, and I don't have it on the screen for you, but Psalms 37, verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Two steps, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Sometimes God has a blessing for you. He wants to give you the desire of your heart, but the desire of your heart's wrong. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desire of your heart. Sometimes it's in the pray, and then pray again, and then pray again, and then pray again. And in the process of praying again, God's shaping you. God's changing you. There's times, even this last week, I was praying for something on on Tuesday, and I kept praying it, kept praying it, and all of a sudden by Thursday, my prayers were different than they were on Tuesday. God just kept coming in, And adjusting me, adjusting my heart, adjusting what I was asking for. I thought I was asking for this. Nope, I'm actually asking for this thing over here. And that's called the leading of the Holy Spirit. Is it's a conversation. See, praying to God like Jesus is talking about, it's not just saying prayers like it's a one direction thing. And it's not a one and done. It's a conversation that constantly goes on. And Jesus is like, don't stop the conversation. Because in the conversation is really good stuff happening to you and for you. Delight yourself in the Lord, and then he'll give you the desires of your heart. Sometimes he, he positions you right in the right spot. When I was growing up, uh, my mom had a pop-up camper, and we would go camping all the time in this pop-up camper. And grandpa would drive the pickup truck with the ball hitch on the back, and he was trying to line it up with the camper because it had been parked. Do you ever see that happen? Right, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, trying to get to the right height and the right spot, and he's trying to, and, and, and he's coming in, and I'm trying to wave him in, right? And, and sometimes he gets close enough, but not close enough, and you just kind of grab the thing and like set it on the hitch. And you're like, well, which one needs to move? They both do. Sometimes there's timing and there's other circumstances you don't even know about. And sometimes it's your heart and sometimes it's all of it together. And God's just smart enough and big enough to know it all. But you keep engaging with him. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Sometimes the delay is building your faith. What does that mean? The delay is building my faith. Sometimes it's in the praying for the thing over and over and over again, and you keep taking it back to God, that all of a sudden it deepens the importance of the entire thing to you. And we are so ADD. Come on, somebody. We're so ADD in this life. It's like we pray the thing, and then we forget about it. And if we pray the thing, and then we move on, and the thing is just answered... That speed sometimes is an issue for our character. I know that sounds weird, but there's a reason they wandered 40 years in the desert. There's a a reason God keeps introducing the delays and the wanderings because it does something about focusing us in on him. Like if I pray for something and then God answers it too fast, I just know me. I will forget I prayed about it and I will give myself the credit for the blessing that happened because I'm an achiever. Got any achievers in the room? Because I'm always doing stuff, right? I'm always trying to be wise, always trying to make good decisions. And if all of a sudden the thing gets settled too quick, it's like, well, that one goes to my credit. 
But if God slows me down and I pray and I realize that I'm absolutely stuck without you, Father, and then he comes through, guess who I give the credit to? King David said in the Psalms, he's like, God, if you will save me here, I will give you praise in the great sanctuary. He says that multiple times throughout the Psalms. It's like he's bartering with God. It's a little bit weird. I'll I'll admit, it's a little bit weird. But he knows, and God knows the reality that sometimes when he makes us wait and he knows us, and then he gives us the yes, we give him glory. There's timing that only he can see. There are other circumstances. There are other people. There's a story. It's from 300 A.D., St. Augustine, some of you guys grew up in churches learning about St. Augustine. He was just this amazing guy, St. Augustine. Um, But the first part of his life, he was an early church theologian and bishop and pastor, just wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, He has this quote. He says, you have formed us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they find our rest in you. Isn't that profound? So he wrote that. Anyway, he was, he was against God for like 20 years, caught up in sin and a lifestyle of sin. And his mother prayed for him. Some churches call her St. Monica, and she has prayed faithfully for him for 20 years. And finally, he received Christ. And you're like, well, why'd she have to pray for 20 years? I don't know. I don't know. And neither do you, and neither does she. But she prayed, and then she prayed some more, and then she prayed some more, and then she prayed some more, and she never gave up. There are people in this room, and you're still praying. And you've been praying like crazy, and you've been storming heaven for years for somebody. Praise God for you. Do you hear the words of Jesus? Keep praying and never give up, he says. And then sometimes the answer is no. There are moments that the thing that we've asked for cannot happen, should not happen, only God knows. And I've got some questions for God when I get to heaven, amen? But sometimes it's the reality. I want to give you some examples of these delays in the life of Jesus and what he did with them because I think it's pretty cool to actually see him walk in this. So this is Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And this is the story of a healing of a blind man And and many of you have never heard this preached before because this is one of the weirdest healings that Jesus ever did. So verse 23, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. And when he spit on the man's eyes, so that's weird part number one. (laughs) So he spit on the man's eyes and he put his hands on him and that's on his eyes specifically. You're going to see that here in just a second. So he spits on his eyes and then he puts his hands on his eyes while he prays for him. And then Jesus asked, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, they look like trees walking around. Now your eye doctor would say he does not have 20-20 vision yet, yes? So something good is happening, but he doesn't have full vision. Now notice what Jesus does, verse 25, once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open for real this time. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. You know why we don't preach this one very often? Because why did Jesus have to do it twice? I don't know. Nobody knows. Jesus and the father know. But he put his hands on there. How's it look? Not right yet. Okay, do it again. (laughs) <laughs> I love that Jesus doesn't throw a fit. And he has to say, why, Father? He just gets his hands right back up there. And if the guy's sight had been a little bit better but not perfect yet, I think he'd have gone a third time. Let's just keep going. Do you see the persistence of Jesus? Don't get stuck about it. Don't get in the dumps about it. Just pray again. Just keep praying again. See, your Savior doesn't just tell you what to do. He came as an example to walk it out before our eyes. So almost everything that you see Jesus say, he shows you how it's done in his own life. I love this. Mark 9, verse 28. Here's another example. There's a a demon-possessed child in this story. 
And the disciples try to cast the demon out of the child, and they're not able to. It doesn't work. And then Jesus comes along, verse 28, afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house, or Jesus had come along, and he cast out the demon. Okay, so then when they're in the house alone afterward, with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. So they had tried to cast the demon out via prayer. Jesus comes and he casts the demon out via prayer. And they're like, why couldn't we cast him out? And he says, because this one only comes out with prayer. Are you frustrated yet? I would be. What he means is more prayer. You need to pray again. You don't just pray and it doesn't happen and you just give up. Pray again. Jesus said, pray. And here's the last one. Mark 14, 35. He went on a little further and he fell to the ground and he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Now, some of you guys know this story already. This is the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is right before Jesus goes to the cross and he dies for our sins. And he knows he's about to be tortured. He's about to be killed. He's about to be separated from the presence of the Father in the first time in eternity. He's about to suffer in ways that we cannot possibly imagine. Now, he knows he came for this. But he still, he is, he is both fully God and fully human. Do you guys remember that? He's both. And so in a moment like this, he's going to go to God, he's going to pray, and he's going to show us his humanity. So he's in this garden. You've got to see him in this garden. And then there's disciples, by the way, and they're, they're kind of barely outside the garden or on the edge of the garden, and they're having their own little prayer meeting. They're actually falling asleep, but Jesus is just him and the Father. Verse 36, he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done and not mine. What a great prayer. Model all your prayers on that prayer. Great prayer. So he says, Father, I'd rather not die on a cross. <laughs> Father, I'd rather not suffer like this. I'm actually making this a formal request. Is there a different way to do this? To save all of humanity? I'd prefer plan B. It's what he's saying. And he's bold to say it because he's letting his humanity out so that we could record it, so that we could see ourselves in it. But not my will, but your will be done. I'm still surrendered to you, he says. Then in verse 37, and then he returned and he found the disciples asleep. So they were supposed to be having their own prayer meeting to support him. They had fallen asleep. They aren't helping him out. I'm going to skip you to verse 39. Then Jesus left them again, and he prayed the same prayer as before. So he had prayed it once, and most of us think he only prayed that prayer once. Nope, that verse says he prayed it again. He went right back to the same spot in the garden, and he prayed the same exact words to the Father because he hadn't gotten his answer the first time. The same prayer as before. Why? Because this is what we're supposed to do. Pray, and then pray again, and then pray again. It's not a one and done. Mark 14, 40. When he returned to the disciples, again, this is a third time, he found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know what to say. And when he returned to them the third time, and I, <laughs> I'm cutting you off because I just want you to see the point. He prayed again. And you're like, well, why? Father, why didn't you just answer him the first time? Because the answer was the same. No, you've got to go to the cross. This is the only way. So what was the point of all three? You gotta, and we don't know. It's between them. But what was God doing? Was, was God strengthening him? Was God reminding him of the Old Testament prophecies that he had to fulfill? Maybe was God speaking words that he knew just to his son? This is what's going to strengthen him and embolden him and give him the courage that he needs. Maybe. 
What was he doing? See, he was in process. See, he was changing. He was shaping. He was building up his son. In Philippians, he says, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Was the father giving him the joy? Was the father setting the joy before him right then and there? Because the joy set before him was the redemption of all mankind. It was every single one of your faces. Did every single one of your faces in Gethsemane come before him? I don't know. Did God give him the joy there? I don't know. But he needed something in praying three times. Have you given up on prayer? Have you gotten discouraged? Have you gone to God with something big and you got the no or you got the delay and, and you've given up? I get it. Me too. Me too. Jesus is calling us back to prayer, which is calling us back to the walk with God. Amen? Would you guys stand? I want to pray over this room. I want to pray a prayer of healing for you. I want to pray a prayer of spiritual revival in your own spiritual walk with God that maybe you, maybe you have struggled in the past. Maybe some very difficult things have happened for you in the past and, and so you just stopped. Jesus is saying start again. And this encouragement was what you needed today. So I'm going to pray healing. I'm going to pray, pray revival for you. Let's pray. Lord God, Lord, I thank you for everyone that you've gathered, everybody that's online right now. God, we're praying for them as well. Jesus, I pray for those who have been struck down by discouragement. And God, I pray that you would lift them back up by your grace. I pray that you would heal them and give them fresh hope, fresh faith. When the Son of Man comes again, will he find faith on the earth? We, that's what we want. So God, make that true in us. Get us back on our knees. Get us back walking with you, believing in you again. In Christ's name, amen.